I'm Chris Moulin, I'm a senior lecturer in cognitive neuropsychology at the University of Leeds and I'm going to talk to you about one of my uh, research interests and a tool I use a lot in my daily life as a psychologist which is the case study approach and what case studies contribute to psychology. So today I'm going to talk about um, historic cases in psychology. I'm going to go through some classic case studies which appear in undergraduate and A-level textbooks. I'm also going to talk in the middle section about some real research that I'm doing and I'm going to be helped out there by one of my PhD students, Nathan Illman. And I'm going to finish up by illustrating case studies by talking about some research I've done into a condition called déjà vécu, which is like persistent déjà vu. So I'm going to introduce to you today five classic cases from psychology. And in fact, these are cases which go beyond psychology and you may have heard of them and encountered them in other places as well. They are that famous. And they range from cases in the mid-19th century going right up to modern-day accounts and modern psychological accounts. So we start with the first case, which is Phineas Gage. And his whole case is summed up uh, with this limerick, which was written at the time. A moral man, Phineas Gage, tamping powder down holes for his wage, blew the last of his probes through his two frontal lobes. Now he drinks, swears and flies in a rage. The author of this uh, limerick is actually unknown, but it sums up a famous case in psychology of a man who had damage to his brain as a result of an industrial accident. So in 1848, Gage survived um, a horrific accident. So on the slide here, you can see um, four different depictions of his accident, and it's actually been the subject of many reconstructions. The basic idea is um, to blow away uh, rocks in the making of a railroad, you have to jam in uh, an iron rod to kind of get the dynamite compacted at the end. One of the hazards of this is, is as you're doing so, you can create a spark which ignites the rod. And this is the horrific part, because Phineas caused a spark like that, and this rod was then fired through his brain, and there are accounts which say it landed out the other side or that it was stuck in there. It's quite likely he didn't actually lose consciousness while this happened to him. Perhaps the most surprising thing about Phineas Gage is that he survived at all. So this was 1848 when this happened. And so he would have had a, a massive injury and he would have kind of destroyed a large part of his brain. The significance for psychology is that he destroyed a specific part of his brain. And he destroyed the part of his brain which is thought to control behavioural urges and instincts and impulses. So in the limerick it talked about a behaviour change as a result of his injury and it talked about in particular him becoming less of a moral man and there are accounts of him turning into somebody who drank a lot, couldn't organise his work and who swore a lot and, uh, and allegedly the story goes beforehand he didn't swear. So the importance of this particular case is that he uh, changed his behaviour as a result of this injury and they were able to say that behaviour is therefore controlled by the frontal part of the brain and it was the frontal part of the brain that was damaged in Phineas Gage's case. The second case in our quick tour of famous cases is Anna O oh, and she was one of Freud's classic cases. She was described as a hysteric and he based much of his theorising on the discussion of her case. The interesting thing about her was that uh, collaborative work between Brewer and Freud was really driving forward theories at the time of psychoanalysis and the talking cure. Many people would have Anna O oh as an example of how to practice psychotherapy and how to give people kind of cures by just talking through what kind of troubles them. The interesting thing is, is that contemporary accounts now possibly suggest she didn't have psychological problems, but she might have had neurological problems. But still the same, a bit like Phineas Gage, the story has stuck and is a useful one in our teaching. The third case is Little Hands, and Little Hands is also a case study published by Freud. And Freud used Little Hands to describe sexual uh, development within children. And in fact, Freud only ever met him once during the course of his therapy, but relied heavily on notes and discussions with his father. Little Hans had problems with horses. When he was four years old, he witnessed a terrible uh, 
event in the local park, uh, an accident with a horse, and since that point he was scared of horses. He was scared of horses coming into his bedroom at night, but he was also scared of horses on the street that might collapse and fall on him. In the tradition of psychoanalysis, Freud's theories are that these kind of fears are never exactly what they seem and they always try to get to the bottom of them and Freud published accounts of why it was this child may be scared of horses and they related to things that we think of as classically stereotypically Freudian including fear of horses penises but also other things like his sister was born at the same time and the relationship he had with his sister and tried to forge with his sister and the jealousy he felt with a new child coming into the house. Freud finally reports in 1922 that he met little Hans, no longer little, but as a, as a young adult, and said that he was perfectly fine and a healthy, strapping, young, fit man and had got over his phobia completely. Of course, one of the things, therefore, Freud might say was that this was a result of all the kind of psychoanalysis that this child had been through. But in modern kinds of terms, we wouldn't be able to prove necessarily whether he just got better all by himself or was, whether it was contributed by Freud's talking cure. We now move on to a very different kind of a case, and this is the first modern case in these series. So in the 50s and 60s, we began to understand much more about the brain, and one of the ways in which we did this was by uh, studying single cases. Patient HM is very, very famous in the memory world because he was a person with a profound form of amnesia and his amnesia was caused by uh, a deliberate surgical intervention on his brain. So neurosurgeons, in order to try and cure him of his epilepsy or at least reduce his epileptic symptoms, removed the part of his brain that was the centre of his epileptic symptoms. So it was the cause of the seizures that he was having, this part of the brain. And in removing this part of the brain, which was a very specific and tiny area, they also massively influenced his memory performance. Essentially, they created an amnesic. The critical point about patient HM is that we were able to understand exactly which part of his brain that was damaged because humans had done it, they had removed this part of the brain. And they were then able to tie that part of the brain to the deficits that he had. And he wasn't impaired in general, he was impaired on only very specific things. So he could remember information over a very short time period of the order of a few seconds, and he could also remember new skills. So he was able to learn new what we call motor skills. So these are things like drawing tasks, and uh, maybe a good example is learning to ride a bike. This is a skill that you acquire, and this is the sort of ability that was preserved in patient HM. Patient HM, therefore, wasn't impaired across the board, he had intact intelligence, he had intact language function, but he had very specific memory problems. So from this we were able to understand what the hippocampus contributes to human memory and specify further regions of the brain which do particular kinds of things. In fact, this kind of neuropsychological approach, this understanding of what particular regions of the brain do, had been around a lot longer, although it hadn't been carried out in such a scientific way. So Broca was a very early um, neurologist who was interested in the localization of function. That means he was interested in what parts of the brain do what things. And in fact, as a neuropsychologist, that's exactly the kind of work I do too. And he was interested in language function. And one of his most famous patients is a case study called Patient Tan. And all he was able to say was one syllable, and that syllable was Tan. But Broca was able to understand, through later examination, exactly what area of the brain was damaged in patient TAN, and therefore, just like patient HM, make some kind of relationship between which part of the brain is damaged and which functions are damaged. So, to summarise what we've seen so far with the um, cases, we have some pros. We have the idea that these cases are historically important, they give detail, so it's very easy to uh, take one person and examine their life and their abilities and possibly their deficiencies in great detail, uh, but you wouldn't be able to do that with, let's say, a whole group of people. These, these cases are very easy to digest. You can quickly get the idea that there is things of, of importance um, with these cases, but you can take away a story. And undoubtedly, they spice up textbooks, lectures, podcasts, 
and the like. They are a way of communicating to our students some critical ideas. Turning to the cons, one of the issues that we have with them, are they scientifically credible? And this particularly goes for the historically important cases. In fact, in 1848, when Phineas Gage had his difficulties, there was very little known of the, at the time about the brain, and there was actually very few published accounts of what he did. And he ended up touring with Barnum, the famous kind of circus uh, set, showing everybody the rod that had uh, gone through his brain and talking about how, in which ways he's changed. So you can imagine that this story might be not credible and exaggerated. The other thing about giving details is, are all details relevant to the story? Do we sometimes make spurious connections between things on the basis of uh, the details we've collected from single cases? A big problem that you will have already thought of is, are these single people representative of a whole group of people? If you do research on one amnesic, is it representative of all amnesics? And finally, perhaps in giving such kind of attractive cases and studies of individual people in great detail, perhaps we mislead students into thinking concepts are easier than they are, or maybe even that people are simpler than they are. Certainly the cases that I work with and the patients I work with don't fall into such easy categories and black and white conditions as the cases that I've just talked about now. Turning now to the contemporary view, the contemporary view is that case studies have a place in modern psychology. And indeed, I do lots of research looking at single cases. And the idea is, is that they are naturally occurring ex experiments. So that means we want to find out about what parts of the brain do, as you've seen, but what we don't want to do is give people brain damage. And yet there's an opportunity, if somebody does sadly suffer brain damage, there is an opportunity to do research onto them which can help in, with the, their care, the care of other people like them, but also to make inferences about how the healthy mind and the healthy brain operates. So you will find a lot of this kind of naturally occurring experiments, especially where conditions are rare as I will later go on to talk about with my own research.